BBC Six Music. The U. With I can see for miles. And I can see for miles because I can see right all the way into Yorkshire where Rob Hughes is at the moment. Hello, mate. Hello, mate. How are you? I'm all right. You're a little bit delayed, actually. So you um, you were saying hello, what are you? And then, like, second later, you're waving at me. It's a bit disconcerting, but it's fine. Oh. These are the trials of satellites, aren't they? This is the thing. I'm so far away. Oh, mate. Unbelievable. Uh, we're looking at Disc and Music Echo here, 11th of November, 1967. What a year, eh? Tasty. What a great year. I'd like to dedicate that to Wildly Childish, because I think he would like that. Ah, uh, well, he might not like this then, because uh, Hit Talk on page three was like a weekly strand whereby a famous name, usually a radio presenter, would give their views on the latest uh, single releases. Uh, this week, it's the turn of ex-Radio Caroline's Mike Ahern, who uh, tried out for a job at Radio One, I've since found out on Top Gear, but only lasted one show. Anyway, he loves Engelbert, Sandy Shaw, Val Dunican. As for the Kinks Autumn Almanac, he says the Kinks record is a load of old rubbish, a nothing record that wouldn't have meant a light if anybody else had recorded it, and I can't hear the words. As for the Who, I can, I can, uh, I can see for miles, he says, it's treble rubbish, I can't make any sense out of it, just a noise. What kind of people buy this sort of record? <laughs> so, I mean, God, if this was his audition for Radio 1, <laughs> you'd, have to, um, you'd have to doubt his uh, judgement, wouldn't you, really? Yeah, I think so. We often talk about reviews amnesty, don't we? I know everybody's entitled to their own opinion, of course they are, but just to call those two records poor is, is just not right. Simple as that. Well, you know, I mean, he probably won't thank you for mentioning it if, if he's still with us, so I don't, I don't know. Do you know, I don't know, actually. Yeah. Uh, although I do know he went to the same school in Liverpool as Kenny Everett, then known as um, Maurice Cole. Well, that probably made it even worse, didn't he? He went on to global star. Oh. Absolutely. In the news page, you got Hello, Goodbye, and I'm the Walrus of the titles of the new Beatles single out on Friday. Their follow-up to the worldwide smash, All You Need Is Love. Hello, Goodbye was specially written by John and Paul as the top side of the new release. It was only completed last weekend. The flip comes from their TV spectacular Magical Mystery Tour and is one of the big production numbers in the film, heard during a sequence shot at West Malling, Malling near Maidenstone, uh, Maidstone. Final sequences for Magical Mystery Tour were shot at Ringo's home in Weybridge, Surrey last Friday. December will see the release of the other songs from the film, but no further details were available at press time. Obviously still very much under wraps, wasn't it? Well, it seems like they've only just finished filming, to be honest. Seemingly so, yes. Spokesman Tony Barrow says, although Ma uh, Magical Mystery Tour is a TV film, this is the first time they have produced, scripted, cast and starred in a film. This may well prove to be a prototype of their next film assignment. Uh, a bit more on the Beatles in a bit. Also in the news and the tiny print, Murray Wilson, father of Beach Boys, Brian, Carl and Dennis, flew in Britain to promote his own album, The Many Moods of uh, Murray Wilson, last week. This is, uh, we haven't got time to go into this, but he wasn't a, a healthy, it didn't seem to be a healthy presence in the Beach Boys camp. Very diplomatically put, I believe he was a bit of a, no, I won't go down there. But I didn't know he had his own album out. Well, that was the thing, you see. Obviously, they got to a certain level of success, and I don't know whether he just felt he deserved it or he resented it a little bit, but he, he made his own, uh, yeah, made his own album. I think it was only one, I think. I'm sure it was, mate. First and last. Also on the news, page five, a mammoth all-star pop show, the first of its kind at the venue, is planned to take place at London's Olympia on the 22nd of December. Full details were not available at press time, but stars in line to appear are Jimi Hendrix, The Move, Eric Burden and the Animals, Graham Bond Organisation, Paper Blitz Tissue, and possibly the Pink Floyd. So uh, I did some research here, Mark. Go on. So this was part of the Christmas on Earth on Earth Festival. The soft Machine Traffic ended up playing. Grateful Dead was supposed to play, but they couldn't get the work visas through on, on time. But it was Sid Barrett's last sort of major show with the Floyd. And the whole thing was supposed to have been, I believe it was filmed, but only uh, footage of Jimi Hendrix doing three or four songs actually exists. What a drag. Yeah, that would have been like spectacular, I feel. Uh, in the news, Lulu, who hold, holds on to the American number one position for the third week running with uh, To Sir With Love, has had to turn down an offer to have her own US TV series because of pressure of work. The series would have tied Lulu to a five-year contract. Her manager, Marion Massey, told Disc this week, we've been inundated. It's a question of what we're not doing rather than what we are. Because of the time factor, it's impossible to accept most of the offers that are coming in. Uh, in America, a new album, Hey Lulu, was released last week with an advance of 200,000. We've 
were talking like the other week, weren't we, about bands who didn't make it in the States from here and perhaps should have done or you thought they would, but Lulu was for a time huge. I had no idea, Bob. I, I didn't know that she'd cracked America. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Well, uh, and Box Tops, whose new single Neon Rainbow was released on Friday, plan to make a promotional trip to Britain in the new year. They also have an album, Rush, release next week called The Letter. I mention this because obviously this is Alex Chilton, isn't it? Of uh, Later a Big Star. Yep. It's his first band. And The Who, who we just heard, are involved in complications over their next LP, The Who Sell Out. The front cover shows a picture of Roger Daltrey sitting in a bath of beans, and several songs of the album refer to brand products, including Medac Germicidal Cream and Odorono Deodorant. Uh, manager Chris Stamp is currently negotiating with the firm's lawyers for approval to issue these tracks, which which sounds like a joke, but Odorona was a real uh, American brand, apparently. OK, but, I mean, that's the... Uh, it takes me to, funnily enough, smells like teen spirit as well, and you would think that these different brands would be very happy to have, you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, albums being sold with their product mentioned on it. You would have thought so. Obviously, they got very precious about all that. Mm. Anyway, um, in the charts, Bobby Gentry. Let's have it. Bobby Gentry and Mississippi Delta. Mark Riley here. Bob Hughes there. Parallel Universe. Yeah, and uh, Disc, 11th of November 1967 here. Radio Caroline on page 7. Radio Caroline rebel DJs have been inside Britain in the past month with police knowledge without any action being taken by the authorities. This was revealed to Disc on Tuesday by Caroline boss Ronan O'Rahilly, speaking from his London flat. He says, uh, Spangles Muldoon and one of the North Ship DJs have been here and the police knew all about it. I can only assume the authorities are playing a waiting game, which is their mistake. Given another 12 months, Harold Wilson won't be able to do anything about Caroline. Caroline International. What I take away from that, Mark, is who was Spangles Muldoon? <laughs> there was two good names within that story, mate. It sounded like you just made them up. Is it a thin, oh, we- is it a thin week? <laughs> no, I didn't make them up. Uh, Caroline's share of the listening audience between the ages of 16 and 24 is 50-50 with Radio 1, according to a national opinion poll in one of the daily papers. More comprehensive audience figures are expected soon to indicate who's winning the battle for listeners. A GPO spokesman replied to o- O'Rahilly's claim by saying, no one has yet been prosecuted under the Marine Offences Bill. That's not to say nobody will be. Uh, the issue is to be raised in the House of Commons in the near future. You forget, don't you, that obviously Radio 1, when it's at its inception, was in, um, you know, really sort of going head to head with the pirates for a while. Yeah, well, have you, have you, you've seen the, the film Slade in Flame, haven't you? Of course, yeah. Yeah, and they go out to yeah. a, a ship, don't they, to do a um, to do a, <laughs> an interview on the pirate broadcasting ship. And it's, yeah, just brilliant. It gives you a real idea of it. Yeah, completely. Uh, In the news, I had to double check this to see if this was true, and you may have heard of this, but I hadn't. Uh, Warren Davis Monday Band, an unknown British group, have signed a five-year contract worth half a million pounds with 20th Century Fox to do a 26-episode TV series which will compete with the Monkees. Titled Number 54 Putney Bus, the series will be shot in colour on location in London and the storyline is about a young millionaire, Warren Davis, who leads the life of an aristocrat by day and leader of a pop group who travel to all their dates by London bus by night. Barnstable born Davis is in reality a former male model and actor whose Monday band have had three unsuccessful singles. The group goes to Hollywood in January for final talks, then they come back ten days later to start shooting the opening episode. Uh, does this ring any bells? None at all, but I would watch it. Sounds great. I mean, it does sound virgin on so bad it's great, but whatever. I, I don't know. Did it ever happen? I don't think it happened. Right. Sadly, it didn't happen. Didn't even do a pilot, as right. far as I know. Uh, and just briefly here, it's 1967, and so disc devote four pages to the fact that it's the fifth anniversary of the Beatles. Uh, it says, here we go. It's five years ago this week, on November the 10th, 1962, the Beatles' success story began when their first hit, Love Me Do, crawled into the charts at number 28. Today, they're even more influential. Disc examines the whole fantastic story in this four-page special. And it just caught my eye because probably this was the first time, I'm guessing, that pop journalism started to realise it had a past that it could draw from. It was almost celebrating itself. Because prior to this, there was no kind of um, celebration or tributes to what had gone before. This is where you could obviously 
draw a lot from this because so many bands were influenced by the Beatles at this point. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of what they were used to write about anyway previous to that would be just tittle-tattle, wasn't it? Mm, you know, absolutely. I mean, the journalists didn't really get stuck into any meat at all, did they? They just It was a graduate sliding process that led to, like, 1972 when all of the journalists like Charles Murray and all yeah. those came through and started really kind of giving an opinion and writing weighty tomes rather than just interviewing people and talking about what the house looked like. Yeah, that was the same thing. The same thing that Brian Eno used to talk about, wasn't it? When Roxy Music suddenly in '72, you know, people like Roxy and Bowie had 15 years since rock and roll had all this sort of pop culture to draw from and borrow and steal and use. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you know what? Uh, there's a the herd. Amazingly, uh, the three other members of the herd are really jealous of the fact that Peter Frampton is becoming the main guy, and he's still only 17. Well, he, he had the looks. He did. He should, did. We have, should we have the sound as well? I might as well now we're here. <laughs> That is a great tune, actually. That is a herd, and from the underworld, I'm Mark Riley from here, and Bob Uzi's over there. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Peter Frampton of the herd at that point. So, 1967, a year later, he was in Humble Pie, wasn't he, with Steve Marriott? He sure was, and he took his mate David Bowie out as his opening act. He did. Uh, gigs of the week this week, November 1967. You've got the move at Portsmouth Locarno. What a great time to see the move. Yep. Oh. Bonzo Dog Doodah Band at Nottingham College of Art. You've got the Who, the Tremolos, Traffic, the Herd and Marmalade at Maidstone Granada. Jimi Hendrix Experience at Sussex University in Brighton. The Trogs at the Flower Pot in Birmingham. Long John Baldry at Durham University. Uh, the Nice at Kirk Levington Country Club. Soft Machine Zeus and uh, Sensory Armada at Middle Earth. Covent Garden, Cream at the Central Pier in Morecambe, uh, the Jeff Beck Group at Exeter University, uh, the Kinks at Maidenhead Pierce Hall, and the Crazy World of Arthur Brown at Southport Floral Hall. But easily gig of the week is the Jimi Hendrix Experience, The Move, Pink Floyd, Amen Corner, and The Nice at the Royal Albert Hall. This is a famous package, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, that is the time machine uh, for this week, isn't it? Most definitely. Absolutely, of course. So this is a, a new one on me. I hadn't actually seen a review in any of the papers we've ever been through of this, but uh, and it's an uncredited writer, sadly. But uh, the Velvet Underground and Nico on Verve Records for, and it gives this when they used to give the price as well with the uh, album thirty two shillings and five and a half old pence, right? Uh, it says, for a long time we've been hearing a lot of groovy music all about beauty and love from West Coast groups. The Underground is an East Coast New York group whose material is largely taken from the opposite side of life, e it, sorry, evil and ugliness. Their music is hard rock and roll, brought up to date with electricity. An electric viola adds a distinctive, cruel, harsh note. It's particularly evil on Venus in Furs and Heroin, two of the best tracks on the album, which are never likely to get played by the BBC. The drummer is a girl. The lead singer often sounds like Dylan and the beautiful Nico sings sweetly on the stage uh, Femme Fatale and the lovely Mirror. And that's it. Well, what a great... I mean, that, you have to give person some credit there, if you could, but, uh, yeah, anonymous, that don't work. No, absolutely not. Uh, but it's good to see it in there, because you tend to think that all the papers missed it, you know? Yeah, no, excellent stuff. OK, Bob, well, we're going to play I'm Waiting for the Man, aren't we? We are indeed, yeah. Brilliant. OK, well, thanks to you, Bob, and to Michelle, and to Lewis, and Perfect Peter, and Hobbers, and uh, Gid is next. We're going to leave you with the Velvets. As I say, tomorrow night we've got four specially recorded tracks by the Guy Hamper Trio uh, with James Taylor. So uh, that's me dangling a carrot. All right, cheers all. Bye. <laughs> BBC Six Music. And shut the door on your way out.